Welcome all to this webinar on the nutritional benefits of millets. Uh, we're very excited to be organizing this webinar to commemorate the International Year of Millets in 2023. It's my pleasure to give the floor to our moderator for today. Dr. Chubamenla Jamir is co-lead for Mountain Agriculture uh, for the thematic working group on Mountain Agriculture at the Himalayan Universities Consortium. And uh, she'll be our moderator today and she'll introduce our first speaker. Over to you, Chuba. Thank you very much, Lauren. And um, hello to everybody. I think I, I must greet everybody in a different time zone. So good morning. Good afternoon and good evening to all the participants. Thank you very much for uh, finding time to join us on, uh, in this webinar. This is the third webinar series uh, that we are having. And um, today we are very privileged to have with us um, very renowned and well-experienced speakers for this webinar. Just before we start with this webinar, um, I would like to say a little bit about this webinar and why we are organizing this. The United Nations declared this year, that is 2023, as the International Year of Millets and governments from local to global, institutes, uh, civil societies, businesses and individuals have joined this very pertinent and exciting initiative at various levels and capacities. But the question is, why millets? And uh, it's already now, we've already started half the, the second half of the year. And we, most of us must have heard a lot of things about millets, so I'm not going to go speak about millets, but just very quickly, millets are nothing new to us. Across the world, millets were grown in the past by various human societies and as a stable food. And under the current scenario, that is current scenario where we have resource scarcity and we are also having um, issues related to climate change, this food is considered a smart food because millets can grow under various environmental con uh, conditions, even on, uh, in the arid conditions, as well as with minimal inputs. So they are very smart, important crops, even not only in the past, but in the current scenario. It's not just that, from nutrition point of view also, millets are highly nutritious. They are rich in protein, fiber, and various minerals and vitamins. So to celebrate the International Year of Millet 2023, the STSN is hosting a webinar series and this is the third, the last of the three webinars that we are organizing. And today we are going to introduce to you about the nutritious benefits of millets and also how to prepare these millets. So uh, without wasting time, let me introduce to you our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Jessica Fanzo. She is a professor of climate at the Columbia Climate School. Among a number of positions and accolades, Jessica has served on high level task forces for USAID, the G20, the Eat Lancet Commission, and the Rockefeller Foundation. And she was also the team leader for the high level panel of experts report on food systems and nutrition for the United Nations Committee on Food Security. So we have today with us somebody who has a huge experience and highly knowledgeable in the area of food security. So thank you very much, Professor Fanso, for joining us and over to you. Great, thank you so much, Chuba. And thanks to SDSN for hosting this really important event on millets. Um, I'm going to present a bit of a picture of nutrition and, and some of the benefits of millets. And I hope we can engage in a conversation. We hope our second speaker can also join us, but I think there's connectivity problems uh, for her. And I just wanna thank everyone in, who has joined us online. I think a lot of you, it's evening. You probably wanna be having dinner, hopefully with millets <laughs> um, in that dinner, but um, I really appreciate everyone joining. I'm gonna share my screen. Lauren and Chuba had mentioned, this is the International Year of Millets. And it's really important because every year, proposals are sent to the FAO to be the international year of something. Um, and 
it's competitive to be selected at whatever theme it is, whether it's family farming, uh, it's, a, it's a crop, it can be a number of different themes across the wide uh, spans of food systems. So it's really quite wonderful that millets were selected um, as what would be considered traditionally a neglected or underutilized crop or what we're calling now opportunity crop. So having millets and uh, as the as part of uh, the FAO's international year um, is is really important to to help advocate and and um, spread the importance of of millets as an important crop as part of our diets. And I know many of you probably online have worked in millets. Um, have advocated for this year. So it's it's a really fantastic thing to, to be recognized. And so there's a lot of reasons why FAO gave millets a whole year of celebration. Um, millets are diverse. There's many different types. Um, many of them are growing in drylands, but across different varying agroecosystems. They're often considered climate resilient, tolerant to nutrient poor, degraded soils. Um, they can thrive in drought and harsh growing conditions. They're quite adaptable. Um, they don't need a significant amount of inputs. They're integral to ancestral to traditions, cultures, and indigenous knowledge. They're important for nutrition. I'll talk about that. There's been a lot of work looking at their contribution to human and animal health. Um, they have a low glycemic index. They're diverse in their taste and in their use and the types of recipes they can be used in. Um, and of course, they're an important source of income for many people around the world, particularly for women who are, are working and have been working with millets for decades and decades. And they contribute to what we would consider a thriving, sustainable agri-food system. So there's many different types of millets used and grown around the world. I think we can consider uh, sorghum a major millet, but foxtail, pearl, barnyard, a guinea millet, uh, bonio, very important in West Africa, a uh, finger millet teff grown in Ethiopia, such a variety of, of millets in their texture, um, the way their agronomic practices, and of course their, their taste and how they can be used in our everyday diets. Here's just an example from a paper uh, published by Yusuf et al. in 2021, looking at the nutritional and functional diversity of millets, but particularly processing and how that changes and alters nutrition. And here's just a few pictures of the millet plants and their kernels and how they look. You can already see the, the vast diversity where they're grown from China to West Africa, of course, India, um, Japan. And um, you can just see the diversity in, in, in the shape, the color, and the size and, and where they're grown. This is showing you a map, um, same paper, of the yields of, of millets produced around the world with India producing um, a lot of, of, of millets, followed by uh, Niger produces a lot and harvests a lot. Um, China, we have Senegal, Chad, Nigeria, Mali, Ethiopia, Sudan, Burkina Faso. So there's many countries uh, growing these millets around the world, um, but these are the major producers. When we compare millets to other uh, staple crops, I think this is a nice example showing you rice versus sorghum versus maize versus some of these smaller millets, kodo, little barnyard, and foxtail millet. And this was a paper published by Ruth DeFries, a colleague of mine at Columbia University, who spends most of her field work uh, in India and has increasingly focused on, on millets. And you can see that the nutrient content for 
Uh, many of the monsoon cereals show a substantial difference for protein and iron content, but quite a similar energy uh, content across uh, these different uh, staple crops uh, comparing to millets. Um, rice has the lowest content for both um, protein and iron. You can see here on this far left. Um, with sorghum having the highest uh, protein content. Um, data sources, of course, vary on the iron content. Uh, with two of the four uh, types of small millets, barnyard and little millet, have the highest in iron. Um, whereas compared to uh, comparing to maize, which has very little iron. So, of course, the nutrient content varies depending on which variety of millet you're looking at, um, how it's grown, and of course, future impacts of climate uh, with more uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, there could be implications on the nutrient composition of, of these crops, including the millets. Um, here's another uh, table showing you some of the nutrient composition comparing different millets. And this is showing you calcium, iron, phosphorus, zinc, some of the, the water soluble thiamine, niacin, and riboflavin. Um, I always tend to, as a nutritionist, look at the iron and zinc content because uh, these two nutrients are very hard uh, to uh, reach a sufficient intake for because a lot of these nutrients, these micronutrients are often found in animal source foods and more nutrient dense uh, uh, diets. But for many people in the world, they can't afford animal source foods. So these staple grains and particularly millets for some populations become incredibly important. But if you just look at the iron content, you see the varying uh, nutrient composition depending on which variety you're looking at. And this is you know, one paper done um, by uh, Tripathi et al. In a, chap uh, in a book on millet and millet technologies. And here's the zinc content, not captured across all of them, but you can see the varying degrees. I mean, look at foxtail and barnyard millets versus sorghum, for example. Um, so these two key nutrients, iron and zinc, really interesting to see the composition across the different millet varieties and how much they vary. Um, this was a paper that we published um, several years ago when we were looking at, uh, in India, uh, 34 districts, um, which shows you here on the left, this map of dotted gray lines that outline India's uh, 20 agroecological regions. And we focused in these 34 districts. Um, and what we did was we looked at the nutrient content comparing sorghum, rice, small millet, and maize, as you can see in these, this bar graph on the top. So sorghum in blue, rice in orange, small millet in gray, and maize in yellow. And we looked at, uh, we combined the yields with nutrient content energy nutritional yields averaged across these 34 districts from 2000 to 2012. Um, and what we see is that the iron nutritional yields are lowest for rice and highest for sorghum. And small millets have higher nutritional yield for iron than rice, despite uh, the relatively low yield for small millets. And protein uh, nutritional yields are highest for maize and lowest for small millet. So it's really interesting when you start to look across these different varieties of and and different comparing to different staple crops in a specific region, you can start to see the the differences in the nutritional yield. Um, we also looked at the land required to supply one adult's 100% of dietary reference intake for the three nutrients, protein, iron, and energy shown in the bottom graph. And this reinforces the idea that sorghum 
is the most land efficient uh, cereal to produce iron and maize uh, for protein and energy. So of the four cereals, rice is the only cereal that is less land efficient for producing protein and iron than for energy, which is interesting. Um, and of course, rice is a major staple in places like India, but it really shows the benefits of, of and the differences between the nutrient composition of these crops and the land required. Um, we also looked across uh, nutritional yields, climate resilience, and price of foods. And we see that rice, the dominant crop in the region, is the least land efficient for providing iron and most sensitive to rainfall variability. Sorghum and maize provide high nutritional yields, while small uh, millet is most resilient to climate variability. Price incentives are strong for rice, but what it shows is that no single crop is superior for all the objectives in this region of India. You know, maybe uh, when a crop is more climate resilient, it gets a lower price at the market, or if a crop is nutrient rich, it may not be as climate resilient. So looking at the multiple outcomes that we care about, are crops important for nutrition? Are they important in resilience towards climate adaptation? Are they beneficial for livelihoods of farmers? It's important to look at, at these different objectives at the same time and see where there are synergies and trade-offs. So another uh, area of, of work happening that you'll see a lot in the literature are the contribution of millets to human health. And there's been many studies, but much more research needs to be done to understand the direct attribution and the mechanisms of how millets contribute to better human health. So when you look across the literature, millets have been uh, have properties of being antioxidants, being antihypertensive, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antimicrobial important in reducing cholesterol, important in, in keeping the glycemic index low, uh, anti-carcinogenic potential, promotion of a healthy gut microbiota. So there's been a lot of claims about the importance of millets for human health. But of course, a lot more research needs to be done in this area and is ripe for uh, more funding towards that research. I'll just end with a couple of things to consider. You know, there, you know, as a researcher, I always say that we need more research, um, but we, we really are needing more research on milling technology. How do we ensure that uh, it's easy to process these, these millets? And there's a lot of work being done on that. Um, low resource, low cost kind of technologies that make it easy to for farmers to want to grow these foods and process them and get them to markets. We also need to be thinking about the whole seed system, the quality of these seeds. I'm not an expert on seed biology, but uh, there seems to be an emerging uh, uh, literature around seed savings. How do we ensure that heirloom varieties are saved, but that that savings also involves ensuring that the seeds are of high quality and don't degrade. One issue with millets, like a lot of other staple grains, they can contain uh, uh, anti-nutrients, tannins, protease inhibitors, oxalates, phytates that can bind up key micronutrients like iron and zinc that I mentioned, earl mentioned earlier reducing absorption. So of course, processing again becomes very important to minimize those uh, anti-nutrients and lower uh, particularly things like phytates. Millets can also contain high levels of aflatoxin or B, particularly the B1 form, which has carcinogenic properties and immune system uh, suppression. So again, processing, store post-harvest storage becomes very important for millets. There's also something called kodo poisoning, which I just learned about, but it's a fungal contamination producing cyclopiazonic acid, which is a toxic fungal secondary metabolite, which can uh, 
acutely affect uh, someone consuming uh, millets, uh, particularly kodo millet, uh, causing loss of speech, loss of muscular control, quite scary. Um, so again, uh, dealing with this fungal contamination will be critically important with post-harvest storage and processing. And then overall, there's a shortage of research devoted to increasing yields or quality of coarse cereals and, and particularly millets. So there's a lot of work to be done to mainstream millets, but the benefits and the potential nutrition implications are quite significant for human health. Thank you so much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Panso. That was a very insightful uh, presentation. And uh, may I now give uh, time for a couple of questions from the participants? You can post your questions on the chat. Also a question, Chuba, in the Q&A as well. Uh, yes, there is one. Uh, there's a question by uh, Karima Singh. Uh, she's saying, thanks for the insights. My question is, in the context of the growing emphasis on plant-based protein, particularly in vulnerable communities where nutritional security is a pressing concern, how do you perceive the role of millets as a transform transformative factor? Also, how can this help in bringing the, a new era of plant-based protein? So that's over to you. Yeah, great question, Garima. Um, I think millets are an important part of the story of, of plant-based or let, let's say plant-dominant diets. Um, I think a lot of you know that the way agriculture research and development has been structured over the last few decades has relied on a handful of crops, maize, rice, wheat. And um, if we think about moving towards a more plant dominant diet, so consuming less animal source foods that are intensive on, on land and are contributors to greenhouse gases, we need to expand the diversity of the kinds of plant foods that we consume. Of course, there's fruits and vegetables, there's legumes, there's nuts and seeds, but we need to expand those uh, staple crops, which are very important parts and the, sometimes the main part of everyone's diets to expand towards more variety. And so millets play a really important role in moving away from these traditional crops that were funded for uh, many years and were important to a degree, we can think about the green revolution, for example, but had incredible negative unintended consequences and trade-offs. So, and, and, you know, many of these more traditional crops were marginalized along with the people that grew those crops. Um, and some could argue that maize, rice, and wheat were colonial crops. You know, they were not uh, what traditionally was grown and consumed. So we need to get back to ensuring that those crops are not lost forever. You know, crops are like language. If you don't use it, you lose it. So millets can become really important in diversifying that staple grain uh, basket. Um, and they're resilient. We're, there's going to be places that are going to get very dry. Millets can thrive in those dry environments. So to me, it's a really important solution to diversifying that plant-based diet basket and giving people options um, beyond just wanting to, con I mean, rice is delicious. I know many people eat rice. I eat it too. Um, but why not explore some of these other grains that are incredibly uh, nutrient rich and tasty as well? So, and I have I a feeling know. all these people online know more about millets than I do. <laughs> so it'd be great to hear comments from others and experiences yes. of, of with with their millets. Yeah, we have, uh, I, I'm going to take two questions together because I, uh, they're related. Uh, one question is by Kishore and the other one is by Rashmi. So the question is, what are the health hazards created by excessive consumption of millets? And uh, second, second question is, please ex explain millets 
and microbiota in connection to celiac disease? Yeah, um, I don't know so much of the health hazards, uh, Kishore, and maybe others do online beyond what I had mentioned around whether or not the millet is contaminated with aflatoxin or, or, or some sort of a fungus that can uh, contribute to ill health. Um, I don't, I mean, ex excess in any food can, um, <laughs> there's calories associated with that. And there's, uh, you know, we need more diversity. So excess of millets, I think really the most major concern are these issues of contaminated millets that are not stored uh, properly or processed um, that would eliminate some of these anti-nutrients and, and these contaminants. On um, the celiac, uh, yeah, millets don't contain gluten, which uh, is, uh, of course, uh, one of the issues with, with those suffering from celiac disease. So because millets uh, do not have, have gluten, um, they don't trigger uh, episodes with those who have, who have celiac disease. Um, millets often in any kind of more whole grain um, product also has prebiotics, which are really important in feeding your microbiota. So the more we can consume whole grain products, like uh, Lindaway, who asked about the Japanese eating a lot of rice, moving towards more brown rice is really important because those whole grains are, are full of uh, nutrients that your, your biome loves to consume and helps um, allow for that microbiota to grow in healthy ways and, and has all kinds of human health impacts. So millets, particularly these coarse grains are really important in feeding your microbiota and keeping it healthy and diverse. So the other is the powerful FMCG or processed food industry exerts undue economic and political influences on the micro macroeconomic decisions that sometimes end up deciding the degree nature and behavior of emerging industries such as the millet one. How can food security and entrepreneurs work their way around this hurdle? Mm. That's an interesting question. The hardest and, question. <laughs> and, and, and also, uh, before you answer the question, may I request all the, all the participants, um, you know, you can not just questions, but we would request you, I mean, we would request you to type the questions in the question and answer chat box. And in the webinar chat box, we would request you to, you know, whatever information you have about millets and you would like to share with everybody, we would encourage you to do that in the chat box. Thank you. Over to you. Yes. Yeah, this is a tough question. I mean, the, 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 the power dynamics of transnational companies and the kinds of foods they produce um, is, is a significant elephant in the room, shall we say, um, and how small and medium enterprises can, can face these uh, pressures that some of the industry players that have a lot more resources and um, are very involved in all levels of global food system governance and their influence on governance um, is quite stark. And it's an old question of power and balance, but it's not going away. Um, and how um, particularly small and medium entre entrepreneurs can get around this hurdle is challenging. Um, in the United States, uh, and of course, every country and their relationship with industry is different. I think in the United States, it's one of the most challenging because food industry is so powerful across all levels of government and uh, exerts their power across our entire food supply. So when you have local small farmers who are going up against um, some of these industry players, 
I think one level of power for many of the small holders and, and small scale food producers and processors is working at the local level and building from the community up. It's not, you know, will it change the entire global food system power and balance? No, but where you see power sometimes is at the local community level. Um, and that's important because from that local level becomes that that growth can happen and that influence can happen. Um, and so I think for small and medium enterprises, it's important to work at the local level and build from there. Um, so yes, um, that's my answer to that, but it's a really hard, that's a hard question to, to answer. And, and I'd be curious if Chuba has any insights on, on that because I, I feel this is the big elephant when you think about the UN Food System Summit and everything else. It's just one of these things that's incredibly difficult to tackle. Yeah, thank you very much. No, I, I think you've um, answered it very well. And um, it's a very difficult question to answer. And you know, the answer can be multiple and it's very complex. And what we require is actually collaboration of different entities, different organizations, and at different level coming together and some sort of a convergence and collaborative effort. I think that's something which can help not completely solve, uh, come up with a solution, but at least move towards, you know, uh, that can accelerate our move, uh, movement towards um, promoting millets and making it more popular. This Karima's question that are your concerns about the environmental impact of increased millet cultivation, such as land use changes, water consumption, or soil degradation? And I think there are there is some linkage with uh, the question, uh, the last question which is given by Umar Nafis about uh, third world countries like Pakistan, where there is food shortage, and also all these countries also have the similar issues, environmental issues. So maybe if you can combine these two questions yeah. and answer them. Yeah, thank you, Garima and Umar. Now, again, I'm not an agronomist, and I, I want to say that I think um, you know there's a lot of studies showing that millets have a much smaller environmental footprint than, say, rice or wheat. Um, I think their carbon footprint is about 25% less than those other crop commodities. And there's a lot of data suggesting that millets conserve water, they, um, they're less agrochemicals are needed, but I, again, that depends on probably the agronomy and the, and the soil of, of, of where those are being grown. They don't really require a lot of water, even in dry climates, and they can be grown in soils with high salinity. Um, so they're quite resilient crops. Now the land use change is interesting issue is, is we're using about 40% of the earth's land to grow food. And, you know, there's a real significant debate about how are we going to feed still a growing population by 2050 in the context of climate without extensifying going into new landscapes, usually landscapes that are very biodiverse, forest scapes, for example. So, you know, how do we intensify uh, landscapes in an environmentally sustainable way? So that, that's the big question, regardless of the crop, whether we're moving into new crops like millets or, uh, or traditional crops like millets or extensifying the typical crop commodities and in, in even fruits and vegetables enough to feed the world. You know, how do we do that? in a more in sustainably intensive way without extensifying into new landscapes? That's a, that's a big question. Um, and there's a big switch that needs to happen that farmers are often, you know, farmers are risk adverse, asking farmers to stop growing rice and start growing millet, it's, it's a challenge. So, but overall millets are quite resilient, particularly in dry regions. To Omar, great question. The Ukraine-Russia crisis has 
put some of the major crops like wheat and uh, other crops uh, at very high market prices. Um, and this is a great example where two significant breadbasket countries go to war you can see the ramifications on the entire global food system and food prices and the implications on food security. Isn't it incredible? Just two countries have upended the global food system along with climate change and extreme weather events and the long tail of COVID. COVID cases are going up where I live right now in New York again. You know, we're, we're having uh, and we're seeing constraints on the global food system. So again, this is a perfect reason why we need to move away from just a handful of crops and being so dependent on those crops to diversifying the crops that we grow and diversifying the kind of foods that we eat. Millets fit into this picture. So Mar in, in Pakistan, could there be opportunities to grow more millet um, and uh, be and for particularly for countries where millet can grow uh, in India, can they be the major bread? India is already a major bread basket for the world, it feeds a lot of the world, but can it grow even more so um, and, and create more demand for some of these other crops, as opposed to us relying so much on maize, rice, and wheat, which can have significant ramifications um, on global food prices and, and global food security. Thank you very much. Um, there, there, there is, there are a couple of questions, couple more questions. So one is, but both of them are speaking about the nutrients. So by Arun and Mubashar Ali. So one is which millet has more nutrient value uh, producing millet by using traditional process or by using current technology. Please mm. let me know. And also need to know quality of soil and weather conditions for cultivation of it and to get good quality products. And the other question is, do millet contain phytic acid that can be hazardous for absorption of nutrients? And I think this is linked with uh, you know, the presentation that you made, made about your work. So over to you. Yeah, on phytates, yes, they can contain phytates and that can bind these divalent cation nutrients like iron and zinc. Um, so yes to that. Um, soil agronomy, I'm not the one to answer that. I'm not a, an agronomist, so sorry about that. What was the first question, Chuba? Uh, which millet has more nutrient value? But I think this question is related to producing millet by using traditional processes or by using current technology? Yeah. Um, I, I, as I showed in my presentation, it really depends on the variety. And of course, it depends on the processing. So not such an easy uh, question to answer without going to, into some of the food processing technology, but it can really vary by nutrient. It can really vary by the variety and the processing that takes place. Yeah. And I'm happy to share my slides and the and the references that I have that go into some of the detail. There was one paper um, that I uh, had presented that goes into great detail about the nutrient composition and how it changes with processing. Um, and that was in a textbook that you can, and if anyone can't download it, I'm happy to send it. Um, but there's a paper by Yusuf et al. in the Food Research International that looks at the functional changes during processing of different millet varieties. And then there was another paper in a book, I think it's open access, called Millets and Millet Technology, produced by Springer in 2021. And that too goes in great detail about processing and how that changes the functionality and nutrient composition of, of different uh, millets. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and in, you know, since there was a question uh, related to traditional and uh, modern technology, um, one of the problems uh, using traditional technology is that because millets, it's, it's uh, you know, the processing of millets, the primary processing of millets after the harvest, it's a very uh, 
tedious process and it requires a, 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 a you know a very um, strong instruments or uh, which can you know process them and many a times uh, these traditional methods are not able to do it because of which the shelf life even the shelf life of the millets cannot be stored. Uh, it, it's very short. So you cannot, once you've processed it, once you've done the primary processing, you're not able to store it for a very long time. And therefore, there are times when modern technologies are also required for that. Um, to, today, Susan, Chef Susan Senesi was able to, uh, was supposed to join us and give us a recipe on uh, how to cook millets. But there are some, uh, there is some, uh, network issue at her end because of which she's not able to join so uh, we will have to skip that um, but maybe I can just uh, give the time to Lauren maybe if you can speak about a little bit more about that yeah I'll just make a couple comments uh, this is the third uh, webinar in our series celebrating the international year of millets um, talking about the processing, uh, the issue that you were, we were just talking about, I encourage everybody to watch the second webinar. Uh, Chef Pierre Tiam uh, has an uh, international brand of Fonio, uh, and he talked a little bit about some of the processing challenges that they've encountered with that, um, since that's a very small grained, um, small kerneled millet uh, that you might find interesting if you were interested in that topic. Um, other than that, I just wanted to remind everyone that we do have a youth photography contest uh, and we're still accepting submissions until the end of the month on August 31st. You can submit on Twitter or Instagram and you just have to use the hashtags uh, internet IYM 2023 for International Year of Millets 2023 uh, and the hashtag my millet uh, and we ask everybody to tag at UNSDSN. There's a link in the chat uh, if people want to grab it real quick. Uh, it's just the main SDSN website on all of our International Year of Millets events and it has the full details on how to submit photos and the, um, the criteria uh, for eligibility. Uh, and I'll just say thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Fonzo. And um, Chuba, closing word. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren, for that. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today. And uh, there's, I think uh, Jessica has shared uh, the talk, PPT, on the chat, so you can download that quickly uh, before this webinar ends. And also, um, so some of you has mentioned about the presentation. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, this is the third webinar, and uh, we are also going to come up with a booklet, a booklet which will be a combination of the talks that are given by the resource person, including the web, uh, including the recipes that has been shared by the chefs in the three different uh, webinars. So um, we will be, I think, in touch with you, and we have your emails. So once this is out, then we'll uh, share it with you, the link. So we would request you to stay in touch and please to share about the photographic concert, uh, contest that is there, especially this is for the young people. So we would like to encourage all of you to request young people to be part of this because this is, we still have half a year left because it's just the start of August. Uh, well, a li little bit less than half a year left for International Year of Millets. And, but still, that means we have few more months to go where all of us, it's an opportunity for all of us to come together and promote this wonderful food, which is nutritious and which is also very good for the environment. So promote it in whichever way we can. And let us come together and let us hope to meet you all for more such events in the future. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Fanso, uh, for your insightful talk. And also to Lauren for organizing this uh, wonderful webinar series um, by the STSM. And thanks to everyone. And have a good day to those who are in the morning time zone. And good night to those who are in the evening time zone. Thank you. Thank you.